Thank you for tuning in to the Bread of the Word podcast. Bread of the Word is an online ministry striving to feed people the life-sustaining bread of God's Word. Bread of the Word exists for the reclamation of the Bible in the heart, mind, and walk of all the saints of God, for it is the Bible itself which is the ultimate standard by which people are to live and honor God. Thank you for tuning in. This is Bread of the Word. Hello, and welcome back to the Bread of the Word podcast. My name is Tyler. I'm your host. I'm excited to be with you guys this Sunday afternoon. I hope you've had a great week, and I'm excited to be digging back into Psalm 119 with you. We've been doing this for nine weeks now. Uh, nine weeks. That's a good long run, and we've we've come across a lot of scripture, and it's there's been a lot of good stuff that we've come through. And I'm excited for what God continues to do with the series. And so we are picking up in verse 65. And we're going to read through verse 72. And so I want to back up a little bit. What I, one thing I've continued to hit on is the fact that this is poetry. There's, there's an element of linguistic beauty that is demonstrated here. That there, There's a lot of effort that goes into laying out the words the way that they are. And so there's a certain format over these 176 verses. It's split up into um, 22 um, stanzas. And oftentimes these stanzas are grouped together by theme or uh, some things like that. And so a lot of what we have talked about thus far has been kind of laying that groundwork for the, um, the Word of God. That that is the starting point that it talks about. Um, but it's also been on the subject of action and conviction. However, we seem to have entered a new segment within Psalm 119 that it's going to span a few. But this one is less about the action, but it's more introspective. It's more looking into what is in the author's heart, where he's been, where he's going. and kind of... It's reflective, it's introspective, he's looking within himself to what God has done and is doing, what has happened before. He is now writing, and he's kind of relating all that together, and it's very interesting. And so this passage seems almost like a journal entry. The last section was almost like an action plan. And then this new one, um, verses 65 through 72, is focusing on what the psalmist has been delivered from in the past and how this relates to his present circumstances. And so it's an interesting um, transition. Um, and so, again, this is, this is poetry. There's a very specific way that it's laid out. And Hebrew is an interesting language when we really dig into it. And one thing that becomes clear is um, it's a hard language to translate. And so, if you watched the last episode, we read the passage out of the King James Version, because it seemed to read better in the King James than the ESV, which is what we have typically been in. And this passage is likewise. There are some linguistic elements that are a little difficult to translate, but it seems that the King James does a better job than some of these other ones. And so, we'll be using the New King James this for this opening passage. And the New King James is like the King James, except it's a little more modern. And what I mean by that is it doesn't have the these, thous, thys, haveth, and all those funky words we haven't used in a while. And so, it's going to be a little modernized in that sense, but still have that original wordage where it matters. Right? If you've got some questions on uh, Bible translations, um, this August, um, Bread of the Word will be putting out a video. It's our monthly book report, but we're going to be talking about Bibles and kind of what, what are good Bibles, what are not so good ones. Um, 
making sense of all the different kinds and materials and translations and all that good stuff. Kind of a, a crash course on Bibles. It's not the final authority on Bibles. This is just my perspective and what I've learned and some of that. And so be on the lookout for that this coming August. And then um, actually in a couple weeks, I will be recording the um, next BOTW book report talking about the book of Psalms and the application that um, the book of Psalms has in the, in the life of the Christian and how we reintegrate the book of Psalms into our lives, not just in corporate worship, but in private worship, in our devotional life, the way we seek God, how all that good books to help us navigate that. And I'm excited for that one. Uh, we're talking about two Puritan works in there, so I'm, I'm excited to be sharing that with you guys. And so, without further ado, let us dig into Psalm 119, verses 65 through 72. You have dealt well with your servant, O Lord, according to your word. Teach me good judgment and knowledge, for I believe your commandments. Before I was afflicted, I went astray. But now, I keep your word. You are good, and do good. Teach me your statutes. The proud have forged a lie against me. But I will keep your precepts with my whole heart. Their heart is as fat as grease. But I delight in your law. It is good for me that I have been afflicted, that I may learn your statutes. The law of your mouth is better to me than thousands of coins of gold and silver. As we've said, this is part of a, a segment on that's very introspective. But within that segment, it seems that Psalm 119 also has segments within itself. And so, really, this psalm seems to be laid out in two sections. The first three verses, and then the last five are kind of the two halves. And so it's interesting how that's laid out, but verses 65 and 66, um, it, the psalmist is bringing to mind the ways that God has been good to him in the past. It says, you have dealt well with your servant. This is a truth that we could spend many hours, many days, many... We could, we could spend a lot of time trying to dissect that one statement. God is good. And by what standard has God done well with the servant, according to your word? The Bible ultimately is an articulation of the nature, character, and actions of God. That we may know and fear him and give him honor and glory. And so when he talks about, when he is reminiscing, I guess you could say, when he is looking backwards at how God has provided, that was a common practice in Israel. That was not something new, something rare. Um, Joshua 4 is an interesting example. Um, to set the scene, um, Joshua is leading the Israelites through the wilderness to um, the Promised Land. And so they have come to the Jordan River. And what's interesting about the Jordan River is it was uncrossable. And so they had to cross the river. But it's in, what happened is they had the, the Ark of the Covenant go first to show that which the Ark of the Covenant was a representation of the presence of God with his people. And so the Ark goes first, and the water um, dries out, and it becomes dry land, and they walk across. And the significance of that is the Ark is first, to make it clear that this was an act of God. This was not a random miracle, but that God is the one that brought this about. And so when they cross the river, when they all get across, um, Joshua instructs them to collect stones from around the river, and they make a memorial. And so the purpose of this memorial was to memorialize it. It says in verse 20, 21, it says in verse 21, And then he spoke to the children of Israel, saying, then you shall let your children know, saying, Israel crossed over this Jordan on dry land. Over as the Lord your God did in the Red Sea. 
which he dried up before us until he had crossed until we had crossed over that all the peoples of the earth may know the hand of the Lord that it is mighty that you may fear your God forever again we have this example of laying out a reminder a physical reminder of the provision of God some people I've heard of people that they have what's called a Joshua box and what they do is they they have a box and they put reminders in there of things God has brought them and their family through over 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 the course of time and so I have a Joshua box I have a little wooden box and in there I have verses that have that God has used to um, minister to me over the course of my life I have my boarding passes from when I went on a mission trip to Kenya I have some of those things in there and that is this idea of remembering the providence of God of remembering the goodness of God is something that we ought to take very seriously um, because the Israelites demonstrated a focus on what God has done in the past and what this tells them about God today. Because if God is the same yesterday, today, and forever, then when he is good and provides in the past, he is good and provides in the present. As it says in the Westminster Confession of Faith, God, the, cre the great creator of all things, doth uphold, direct, dispose, and govern all creatures, actions, and things from the greatest even to the least, by his most wise and holy providence, according to his infallible knowledge, and the free and immutable counsel of his own will, to the praise of the glory of his wisdom, power, justice, goodness, and mercy. To break that down, God, the great creator of all things, upholds, directs, and governs all things. From the greatest even to the least, there is no hierarchy in God's plan, he is over it all. And he sustains all these things by his providence alone. That nothing happens that he didn't know about or didn't ordain. The greatest doctrine in all the Bible is the sovereignty of God. The fact that God is in control of everything. That when the world doesn't look like we want it to look, that God is still in control and is molding it and shaping it to the highest possible good according to his holy standard. And when it says, according to the free and immutable counsel of his own will, God didn't need to do any focus group testing to see what the earth should look like. He didn't have to call his therapist or anything. God needed no advice because God is the epitome of wisdom and goodness. And as such, no one can come up with a better answer than him. So when he is ordaining things according to the most wise and holy counsel of his own will, we can have confidence that God knows what he's doing, that he is a good God who does good things, that God is ultimately working for what is right, what is noble, what is good. Alright, and so that ties perfectly into where this passage is going. Because since God is good, since God has dealt well with his servant, it says, O oh Lord, teach me good judgment and knowledge. Because you've been good thus far, teach me good judgment and knowledge. Grant me wisdom that is pleasing to you. A lot of people have knowledge or judgment, but we need to have both. We need to both know what is good and be able to identify it so that we can do it, right? And so that is this, what the psalmist is saying. Since you have been good, you have done well. Guide me in my growth. Make me more pleasing to you. Make me more honoring to you in the way that I think, in the way that I act. Conform me to the image, to your image. Verse 67, before I was afflicted, I went astray. But now I keep your word. In the past, the psalmist has been afflicted. And he has gone through trials and struggles, much of it likely caused by sin, as have we all. But he writes that the affliction drew him closer to God. God uses an interesting math when it comes to affliction and difficulty. Um, Charles Spurgeon once wrote that affliction is received as good to the Christian, but not to the unsaved. That as a Christian, we have a different outlook on affliction, because ultimately it draws us to God. 
while as the unsaved looks at affliction and does not conclude that God is good, that God is going to deliver them, they come largely come to the conclusion that the universe is out to get them. But we see affliction in light of the sovereignty and goodness of God. And so, God has interesting math in that. Okay, He takes negatives and he creates the best positive. He doesn't settle. There's no settling with God. God is good. God is the highest form of good. He creates the best possible, possible positives because, verse 68, you are good and you do good. Do we believe that? The goodness of God was such a vital characteristic of God in the Old Testament that the enemy tried to discredit it from the very beginning. The account of Genesis 3 tells of a temptation to doubt the goodness of God, to doubt the sufficiency of God. And that is what led to the first sin in the Garden of Eden, was the question of whether or not God was truly good, or if God was holding out on us. If God was keeping something from us, if he was trying to hold us back and hinder us and keep us dependent on him, when we could be just fine on our own. And so when Adam and Eve questioned that goodness of God, whether God was truly enough, it led to sin. And so from the beginning... The, the battle has been over whether or not God is good, whether or not God is enough. That was the first temptation, was to doubt the goodness of God and the sufficiency of God. But God is, in fact, the highest and most perfect good. We can trust God. He is more than trustworthy. He is God. And because He is good... Verse 68, you are good and do good. Teach me your statutes. Because God is good, everything he does is good. Not just good, it is the most good. Therefore, the law coming from God is good. Theonomy is not something to be avoided. The rule of God, the law of God, what God has decreed is right, noble, and true is largely regarded by the modern world, and that includes the church in that, is largely regarded as being like a cult. You know, we use phrases like theocracy. We don't want a theocracy. We want human will. We want to have autonomy. We want to be able to determine what is right and kind of have God be okay with that. What we ultimately are looking for is God's holy stamp of approval on the things we are doing. But that is not the narrative of Scripture. Okay, Scripture is... Scripture points to God as the sole authority, not us. So when we read about theonomy, when we read about the law, the law is not something to be avoided, it's something to be embraced. If, God, if we truly believe that God is good, then we believe everything he does is good. Everything he provides is good. God doesn't hold out on us because of good things. So when the law, when we read the law, the law is good. The law came from God. The law is good. When God gave the law, he didn't give us a partial program. He didn't give us an incomplete picture or, or an equation that couldn't be solved. The Bible says the law is not only good, but that it is perfect. We've been, we've been in Psalm 119 for a while, but Psalm 19 is just as great. Psalm 19 is dedicated specifically to the law itself. Psalm 19 begins in verse 7 by saying, The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. And so, what we are seeing here is, the law is good. The law is perfect. And what that means is not just is it a good thing to insti instigate into our practice, but that the 
law of God is ultimately the perfect standard. Okay, and so when we read about the law, the law was not abolished by the person and work of Christ in the sense that it is no longer applicable. But ultimately, the law is the standard by which we are to live. And there are certain elements of the law that are no longer in play. Okay, we are no longer offering sacrifices in the temple. We will never again have to do that because Christ has atoned for sin as the final perfect sacrifice. So the sacrifice laws no longer apply because the sacrifices were pointing us to the Messiah who is to come. And so we look to Christ who has come for atonement of sins. Amen. Hallelujah. So we don't, we are not held to that. We are not held to the, much of the judicial law, which is um, a lot of the, the temple conduct and, you know, the different food restrictions and things of that nature. That is, those are not things we're bound to, again, because that was for a time. But those were ultimately fulfilled by Christ on the cross and by resurrecting from the dead triumphantly. And did he fulfill the other laws? Absolutely. But, he, but those laws are still applicable to us. The moral law, what is right, what is wrong. The Ten Commandments, largely. It shows us what is right, what is wrong, and what is pleasing to God. And why do we do this? Why, why is that important? Because Isaiah 2. Isaiah 2 is an incredible passage. There is a lot of good stuff. In Isaiah 2. Isaiah 2 is a picture of hope that is to come. Isaiah 2 um, follows Isaiah 1, which is a layout of judgment on pe God's people for idolatry and rampant sin. And so Isaiah 2 is a picture of hope that is to come. Isaiah 1 through 6 is interesting. It follows this pattern of judgment, hope, judgment, hope, judgment, hope. And then it gives us a picture of God's holiness. It's, it's really cool. You should definitely look into that. It's, it's awesome. And so, Isaiah 2 says, Now it shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be ex established on the top of the mountains. I mean, it is the highest mountain. And shall be exalted above the hills, and all nations shall flow to it. That's, that's important, flow. You see, water doesn't go up, up mountains. It doesn't naturally flow like that. It has to be drawn up mountains. It has to be drawn in. Many people shall come and say, Come and let us go to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, and he will teach us his ways, and we shall walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law. And the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. Let us walk in their ways. So they're talking about the law. The law is what's leading the nations to the presence of God in this vision. And so the law goes out and it draws the nations to God. It draws them in. Okay, and so when we read, the law shall go forth from Zion. That the law is what is going to draw the nations to the foot of Jesus. That, and that er, at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow, and every tongue shall confess. That is ultimately what we're striving for, is that God is glorified by the nations. And so, that is what we're fighting for. This is what we're, this is where this ends. You know, we're, we hear a lot of opposition to a theocracy. But the fact of the matter is, if it's not a theocracy... It is subpar. If it does not submit to God's law, it is sinful. The mindset of the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. We have to change our worldview to reflect what God has said is good and right and virtuous. And that ultimately is in the word of God. Okay? And so when we dig into the word of God, this is what we see. Is We see God. We see what is right we see what god has called holy pure what he has called us to do and what he has called us to not do the ultimate standard of what is right and wrong is not what's defined by cnn or fox news or the mainstream music outlets but what is ultimately written in god's word 
It is the revealed word of God that provides us the standard by which we are to live. And are we going to get it perfectly? Of course not. But it is because we couldn't get it right that Christ came and died on a cross to atone for the sins of his people. That we could have a bridge to God. And everyone who comes to God in faith, who confesses of their sins and, and the lordship of God and, and submits to that rule, will be saved and their sins will be forgiven and they will get to walk in his ways and in his path. They will be able to go up the mountain to Zion. That's ultimately where this goes. And that is why Christ came, was to provide us with the way of salvation, to be the means of salvation. We are saved by grace, by the grace of God, through faith in Christ. And that is, that's the gospel right there. So he is good, and he does good. So teach me your statutes. Verse 69, The proud have forged a lie against me, but I will keep your precepts with my whole heart. Their heart is as fat as grease, but I delight in your, your law. Now, he is talking about the present situation now. He's been reminiscing. He's been looking backwards for a while, but now he's looking forwards to what is ahead of him, what is immediately in front of him. And so, first of all, there is he's dealing with rough people. He's dealing with slander. He's doing, dealing with things of that caliber. But this is not just a finger pointing, but this is also a comparison. This is also him going, I was that way. I was like that. I used to walk in that, that way. I was in that camp. But now, I walk in the ways of God. And what a, what a wonderful thing it is to know. To walk in the ways of God. To know what is honoring to God and what is not. Because when we don't, it says their heart is as fat as grease. That is a, that is, that's imagery right there. Grease is not a great thing to have in your pipes. You know, I'm sure a lot of us know this, that grease clogs things up. Grease is not a great substance to have lying around in the house. It clogs pipes. It, you can't get water through there. It's, it's sealed. It's hard. It's, it's just mass. You can't do anything with it. Such is the heart of the unregenerate sinner. It is enlarged. It is... There's nothing to it. There's no substance. It's just empty mass. And so, this is... That was the state of all of our hearts before Christ. Is there was nothing to it. It was dead weight. It was empty space. And so, their hearts are like this. But I delight in your law, because I was that way, but now I am different. Because through your affliction, I have come to know you more. And so, he has come across, he has gotten that nailed in his head such bluntly, that he is able to say, it is good for me that I have been afflicted, that I may learn your statutes. Because it was being afflicted in his sins, that led him to God, that drew him to know God more. The law of your mouth is better to me than thousands of coins of gold and silver. That is the value of God's word. We ought to value God's word like that. We should have that, that priority in the things of God. And when God's word is not the priority, things need to shift. Because this is the outlook we need to have. This is the focal point that we need to maintain, is the Word of God. Okay, this is the foundational thing, is God's Word. God's, God's Word reveals to us who God is, what He has done, and what He is doing. And so, we should be passionate about this book. We should have a passion and drive and urge to read this book, to live this book. We should love this book. And so when we look at a lot of these churches, this is not the focal point. I've been in some pretty crazy churches in my day, and I've seen some pretty crazy things get said from the pulpit that were not in accordance with the word. And I think the biggest issue in the church today, in the American church, is that we don't know who God is, we don't know his word, that we largely see this as another book, and we, we value it as such.
But this is the Word of God. This is the inspired Word of God. It is inerrant. It is sufficient. It is infallible. He is good and does good. And because of that, His Word is good. His law is good. And that should be our focal point. Sola Scriptura. When we say that in the Reformed Church, we are saying Scripture alone is the ultimate authority. We, we don't add to what is taught in Scripture. We don't need other systems in place to complement the Word of God or remodel the Word of God. The Word of God is the Word of God. Nothing has the same power as the Word of God. And with that, this concludes this Sunday's episode of Bread of the Word. I pray this was very beneficial to your walk with God, that um, God used this to speak into your life, that this has greatly benefited you in your pursuit of Christ. If you are new to Bread of the Word, I want to say welcome. Um, Bread of the Word is an internet-based ministry striving to feed people the life-sustaining Bread of God's Word, one verse at a time. Bread of the Word exists for reclaiming the Bible, for the reclamation of God's Word in the heart, mind, and lives of the saints of God in every area, in every possible venue, that the Word of God must take hold of, of His church. And we do this primarily through internet content, through social media interactions, through um, Rumble Video, Facebook Watch. We are on Spotify and some other podcasting platforms. You can stream us now. The entire backlog of the series is available on those platforms. Um, links will be available in the bio in the comment section if you would like to check those out. But we are on Rumble Video, Facebook Watch, Spotify, um, a couple other places. Also, um, there is a, if you go down to that bio, you're also going to find a link to a um, article, to an article written by Bread of the Word. It's something that God put on me to write and send out for free by any means necessary. I want you guys to have that. I want you to read it. It's called The Two J's, The Joy of the Potter and the Journey of the Clay. And it's talking about um, how this world is as crazy as it seems right now. This world is firmly in the hands of the potter. God's got this and nothing can stop him from shaping this world into what he would have it to be. And it starts with him shaping people into what he would have them to be. And so I want you guys to have that. I want you guys to um, read that and share it if you feel led. But this is a message that needs to get out. And so that will be available in the, the bio there. I'll put, put links down for that. Um, I hope you guys have a great rest of your week. God bless. Matthew 4.4 4.